Um, well, well, thank you very much. I'm uh, glad to be here and have another chance, thanks to the organizers. I've learned a tremendous amount um, uh, this week. I'm very impressed. I've been so impressed that I've sort of had to, I think I have to sort of change the content of my, my talk, uh, because I'm sort of going to be, I think, a little bit of a dinosaur in, in offering some musing from past experience that are perhaps a little different, but will hopefully be useful. I'm going to try and do it um, in, the, in these reflections to give some responses in terms of how one's facing various questions that have come up and that people have. And so the first question that um, I want to focus on, because it sort of talks about how I started, was uh, people ask, why should I worry about global warming? The Earth's temperature has always been changing. It's changing in the past. It will change in the future. Why worry? Um, my early um, activities were using a sort of orange slice version of a climate model back in the 60s to look at different suggested hypotheses about ice ages and uh, things. And, we, and this was all before Milankovitch really was, was, uh, was pretty well demonstrated with Jim Hayes' core and stuff. But um, it was very interesting, but you learned some lessons from that. I think paleoclimate is something that's really important to, and Earth his history is really important to be talking about here. Um, and I think people have said that as well. Um, be careful in Earth history about saying the word theory. Uh, geologists told me there's no such thing in geology as a theory. Everything is a hypothesis. But I, I say that because um, people use words differently. Physicists sometimes get upset with us for, uh, I mean, that physicists will talk about all these theories, multiple things about the same thing. I was always taught a theory is something's established about, and there's one of them. That isn't what they have. A th for them, when you have that, that's a law. Okay, now it turns out laws, Newton's law, can get overturned or something. So, uh, you know, there are hypotheses. Be careful on that. Um, as I said, I think it's uh, useful. And um, it, when, you answer, when um, I try and answer that question, I say, actually, exactly. If the climate of the past were stable, I'd be much more comfortable than I am that it changed. What we, what we know from the paleo record is that the Earth's climate can change. And that's what should really be worrying us, because it can change a very large amount. Um, there's another sort of pet peeve uh, with me, and I apologize to people who I might, you know, I'm not going to pick on anybody specifically. But just to say, we get asked a lot about, do you believe in global warming? I think scientists really need to step up and say, no. Scientists don't come to their conclusions because of global warming. We come to it because of the evidence. And then you can talk about the evidence. It gives you something to talk about with, with respect to that. And uh, so it can be difficult to do. I wish there were another word than believe. Maybe some you know, English major can come up. I don't particularly like the word think, um, because I'd like to know sort of why they're thinking about it. I think we do face some people like uh, former Washington governor, governor, among other things, Dixie DeRay, who said in a the counter I had with her once, there's no way the puny little man can change God's great earth. Um, and I think we do have to recognize that it can be really hard to convince people that driving your car down the street is going to contribute to the melting of Greenland. Um, and I'll come back to Greenland a, a bit later. Um, so I think we do need to do some public education in talking about evidence. I agree certainly that that isn't all that it takes, but I think we do I uh, need to be focusing on that. Um, but when we say we don't believe in something, people sort of think we're somehow detached. And I think there actually are some things we need to acknowledge we believe in um, in that regard. One is that we believe in careful, objective work in the scientific process, and that's pretty obvious. But I think the second one we have to have a faith of is that we're going to get through all of this. Um, if you go back to 1900 and think about the technologies available today when 1.7 billion people were on Earth, there's no way they could have supported the 6 billion people we had in the year 2000. And there's no way the, the technologies and capabilities and resources we have in 2000 are going to support 9 or 10 billion, 2100. We're having a faith that human ingenuity can get through that. You don't agree? It's not faith. It's a working hypothesis. Working hypothesis. That's fine. <laughs> I'll take that. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I think another question we often get asked 
or is, but the latest results that, are, that come out um, seem to contradict what is said. And I think it's really important then to explain a bit about the scientific process. People have been doing that, but to make sure it's clear, it's a cumulative uh, enterprise. Uh, the, uh, I think the model that the skeptics use for it, when, in my experience, with, they view it as a house of cards. Take out one item and the whole thing will collapse. And so they go after one thing. That's why they're going after the hockey stick in some sense. Um, as Michael Mann keeps saying, that isn't the base of the argument, a lot of it. Um, and at the cutting edge, we need to explain that that's where scientists live. We don't talk much about what we know. That's sort of boring. We talk what we don't know and what we're trying to find out. And so at the cutting edge, we're always going to be arguing about things. And the trouble, some say, at the cutting edge is keeping ahead of the blade. Um, it's going back and forth. That's how we hone these blocks that we sort of add to this pyramid of knowledge. And um, then once it's there, we sort of ignore it. Now, it may be we have to come back and fix cracks and things, but we sort of ignore it. But we really do need to explain the scientific process. But the skeptics don't, I would say. Um, and I think another thing is, in doing that, we need to make sure we reiterate that the fundal, fundamental understanding is very clear. We heard that one the report that was that sort of Mark read from, from 1958, that was very clear in the President's Science Advisory Council report in 1965. And we need to reiter reiterate the main points. And the main points said different ways. Here, a little bit wordier than Susan Hayo puts them. But I mean, there's sort of five or six key points that you need to emphasize. And there's basically no disagreement about them. Sure, there's uncertainty. It might be whether it's degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit, but you know, that's sort of in the, in the noise. And, what seems to me a, to be a problem is there isn't a, a way, or we have to work on a way, to make sure we work on public education. It's interesting that the media don't generally have space in an article to talk about. So they talk about something new, and it gives a sense of disagreement without putting it in context of what has gone on in the past. And it's very important to try and sort of make sure the fundamentals are understood. I ended up doing a lot of that for Al Gore when I was in the Office of the Global Change Program Office because a, a, new, a university study would come out, the press release would claim this or that, and you'd have to say, wait a minute, step back. It's not changing everything. Um, we heard just a little bit about weather and climate, and you have to do both. Um, I think it is really important to do both, that it's that Climate is, in some sense, a mental artifact for most of us. We live the weather. We need to talk about the change in the patterns of the weather, and we can do more of that. Um, and so we talk about extreme weather. Um, this is a pet gripe of mine, um, and I admit it, and it's this notion that we don't consistently capitalize the word Earth. <laughs> the astronomers don't sort of say, oh, it's Mercury, Venus, lowercase Earth, Jupiter. This is the name of a planet. It, um, and I think we need to keep in mind that we want to, in some sense, owe it respect. I don't think it's coincidental that the sun, moon, and earth are the three ones that style guides say don't capitalize. I think that was a way to put down natural religious sort of perspectives, Native Americans and others who sort of respected it. Personal view, pure speculation, but, but it just seems Coincidental, you know, too coincidental that the three specific celestial bodies are the one are the only ones I know of that are where they sort of go to lower case or something. So, um, okay. um, I think it's important to recognize, and we have a real challenge here, um, that what was approved was the U.S. Global Change Research Act, and global change incorporates a lot that talks about, that's sort of a word of the 1990 time, as sustainability was coming out. And so there is this issue of making sure you keep climate change in the context of everything else. Uh, when we were doing the US national assessment, we, the first question was to ask, what else is going on? And then talk about how climate came in and might add to or minimize what's happening or might introduce new stresses. But talk about climate in the context of things. I think this is going to be a real challenge. Um, in the first national assessment, we were trying to figure out, what are we going to call it, a global change assessment? How will people, what will they think about that? I don't think there's much understanding of the word global change. So we stuck to climate, trying to get them in the door. 
and then started talking about some of the other problems. But I think we have a lot of education to do in this regard. Um, one of the things I want to talk about is that there's a lot of this focus on these surveys on these six parts of North America and views. Um, when I went to Washington as a scientist in 1993, thinking we had a lot of science, and then what we found was a lot of, what I found was a lot of contention. My, I tried to figure out why that was happening. Now, it didn't happen upon the one of the six Americas that way, but let me say what, what I found, and I think it's, I think we really ought to be thinking about how we're doing this. So we have the scientific community and we have our views. Um, we try and be expert and offer you know, nice objective opinions. The fossil fuel community, when they're on their best behavior, and I agree there's lots of times they misbehave, but they basically point out that they supply 85% of the world's energy. You've got seven billion people and 85% and they're sustaining their living and you have to acknowledge that they've accomplished something really remarkable. And it helps, to, it seems to me, to acknowledge that up front and making them the bad guy right from the start. I just don't think it's gonna work very well. I think we've gotta convince them as energy deliverers to be delivering different kinds of energy services and I'm worried about calling them, um, calling them out on it uh, too much. Now, there's lots of reasons to call them out, but. Um, there's the environmental community that basically emphasizes, um, you know, we have one spaceship Earth, that's all we have, we're doing irreversible things with it, you have to be very careful. Uh, there's a traditional economic community that looks at, says I'm going to do a cost-benefit analysis, and they look at the costs of changing over, and then they use 5% discount rates or something, and the net present value of the Seychelles Islands flooding is zero. And so they don't really catch it, and they focus on near-term costs. Energy development community, the technologists basically say, oh, just, you know, we can take care of you. All we need is more research money and there'll be a magic elixir that sort of comes out in the end. We have to be cautious of that if that's the only way we go. This idea that, oh, new technology will come and I'll trust that it will come. It may not. I mean, there was nuclear power that was sort of that way, so one has to be cautious of it. There's a moral and ethical community that comes in and talks about equity and other things. There's an energy security community that came in. That was Vice President Cheney. You know, I don't want to have to defend foreign fuels. We'll use America's fuels um, and use coal. So there's a whole bunch of different interests at the table. And it actually affects, it seems to me, what happens with respect to uncertainty in the discussion of it. Scientists, we don't like to be wrong. Let's just admit that. And our way of getting out of being wrong is to propose a big range. So it's going to be 2 to 10 degrees. We don't know the scenario. We don't understand the climate. And we get that number. That lets the fossil fuel community come in and say, all you are certain of is 2 degrees. And we can live with 2 degrees and can adapt to 2 degrees. So they sort of go off that way. And it isn't worth changing the whole world energy system, investing that money, taking it away from medical care and feeding the poor and all these other things, which that's not where the money goes, but whatever, um, and everything, but to, do, to deal with two degrees. The environmental community, responsibly, I'm going to say all of these sort of perspectives have an arguable case for them. Um, the environmental community says, look, you scientists say it could be as much as 10 degrees. We can't risk anything given spaceship Earth and the, we don't have another planet to go to, so we invoke the precautionary principle and go up there. And then they get slammed in the press by defensive environment, or whatever it was in the defensive environmentalism, saying they're already ch always choosing the worst case. In most times, they're choosing the worst case that was put up there by scientists. So we do have to be, take some responsibility there. Um, I sort of commented on some of these other ones about the economic community, engineering community, and focusing on possibilities. The, the ethical community, I think, is really interesting, and it's good it's becoming more active in trying to figure out its various uh, aspects, energy security. And then I added the media at the bottom, because I think what happens with the media is they find one person, and they find another person, and they, have different, they come from different places and say something. And I don't mean to slam all the media, but they, they often will choose uh, I mean, uh, um, some scientists will do a study and then they'll have somebody from an energy think tank paid for by fossil fuels responding. 
and, and you get a difference, and then they'll choose two different people, and you get all these differences. So we have to be sort of careful in, in everything. What we need are people who, who will integrate across these, who will try and find common interests and build common ground. There have been some. Governor Pataki of New York's done it. Schwarzenegger's done it. There's some others. Al Gore tries a different combination and everything. But we have to do that. Right now, what we have is most people on single interest kinds of things, which I think is unfortunate. So uh, I want to just also comment another region related to this is how confident do you have to be in all of this? And so when you go there, when you talk to them, do you, uh, to lawyers or to others, is it beyond a reasonable doubt? That's where the skeptics are pushing us. We have to be certain. Or is it clear and convincing evidence? Or is it um, preponderance or preponderance of the evidence, which is where O.J. was convicted for in the civil trial or something? Or is it risk to the most sensitive? That's all something that we have to be discussing. It isn't just sort of all right or wrong. How confident do you have to be on all of this? Um, well, I'll just uh, say one thing on the Global Change Research Program. Somebody said the, you only want to look at new stuff. I want to tell you the first one had an awful lot of stuff that was well done and went out into the regions. It was the one that had workshops in all the regions and asked for their issues. It's a little hard to find, but it's on the web and you can do that. I wanted to ask a question about, um, just briefly, and I'll be real quick on, on uh, do you know what makes up the United States? Okay, it's 50 states. You know what else? District of Columbia. You know what else? Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Guam and Pacific Trust Territories. Next. Tribal, 566 domestic dependent nations. Okay and 13 Alaska Native Corporations. Congress has made a lot of deals in trying to do this and everything, and a lot of these come, come into the fore. And so it's really important to think about it. Um, I'll just finally say on these national assessment activities that it's really important that we understand we're all coupled together, that every region matters to other regions. Um, in fact, I'll jump to the one on the Arctic, because people were saying, why do I care about the Arctic? It's a distant way. Don't ever let say that to people. The Arctic matters to us right now in many different ways. Certainly it's affecting them, but it's also the air conditioner that sort of affects the weather that we have right now. It affects us here. Plus it's got all that sea ice that's up, I mean all the ice on land up there that's gonna raise sea level around the world. Don't say, oh, it's distant, you don't have to worry about it. Every part matters. If, some, if people get ill in one place, they're going to come over here. There's all kinds of international couplings, migrating species and everything. Don't give up. Don't let them get away with something that's not affecting me. So, I had one more test, okay? One more test for you. All right. What country in the world is the same size as Greenland Ice Sheet? Everybody thinks it's huge. How can we possibly do anything to it? You all know, oh, this is a Mercator map. He's playing a game with me. Okay, so, uh, whoops, okay, here's some choices. You want to cho choose one or something like that? There's one that's almost exactly the same size as the ice sheet. Okay, okay, turns out it's Libya. Okay, so you might hear stories about Greenland. Oh, it's huge and it takes all this time to trek across it. It's an ice cube the size of Libya in the world, that's all. Okay, Australia is four times bigger. Brazil and China are five times bigger. Canada is almost six times bigger. India, look on India on that map. India is twice as big, almost, well, or 50% more I think it is. 80% bigger than, than the Greenland ice sheet. Boy, so how would you answer the question and how would the public answer the question? Thanks. <laughs>